So if there's an asteroid coming, and the scientific community knows with great certainty when the asteroid is going to strike Earth and thereby remove all habitat for humans, some people want to know, and that's me. And since I want to know, I just assume everybody else wants to know too. So I'm on, a, I'm on a plane on a far too regular basis, and there's always somebody sitting next to me, it's almost always a woman in her 60s or 70s, and she, poor woman, is trapped there in the window seat. So I have the aisle seat, and she brings up the asteroid. Every time, it's astonishing, she wants to know about abrupt climate change. It's weird, she says something like, hello. <laughs> I'm just like throwing the door wide open to conversation. So I assume you want to know about the asteroid too. If you don't want to know about the asteroid, when it's going to hit, or even that it, it exists, now would be a good time to leave. I don't know any other way to tell people that Earth is going to lose habitat for humans in the very near future without actually telling them that. So I try to use the asteroid. Never works. As it turns out, there's a relatively recent paper pointing out that climate change represents a greater threat to humanity than asteroids. So, when I click this button, oh, Anything. <laughs> you gotta fix exactly. That's why I was gonna follow it. <clears throat> Some people accuse me of having no hope, and that's correct. Because there is no hope. Because hope is the other side of the coin that has fear on the one side. These are reactions to a future we can't predict with certainty. So I'm with Nietzsche on this one. Hope in reality is the worst of evils, for it extends the torments of man. Were he not such a misogynist, he might have included women in there too. But whatever. In response to my presentations and my message, some people despair. So I like to quote Edward Abbey, the Tucson based iconoclastic writer that action is the antidote to despair. And in fact, taking a, a Buddhist-inspired perspective, I believe that we should act, even if the outcome won't be what we think it is. That we should take actions we believe are, are right actions, independent of the outcome, not being attached to the outcome. Because the outcome doesn't look good, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do the right thing. And I think we should act regardless. If you're damned if you do and damned if you don't, let's do. Let's do something different, something beyond the mainstream. In the inter Intergovernmental Panel's on Climate Change's latest assessment, their fifth assessment, which was officially released last year, but heavily leaked beginning in September of the year before, the IPCC concluded that global warming is irreversible in the absence of massive geoengineering of the atmosphere's chemistry. An approach headlined by Truth Out a short time later as fantasy technology, and subsequently confirmed with abundant referee journal literature, indicating that in fact every known method of geoengineering is fantasy technology. We don't know how it works, we don't know what we would be doing, and we'd almost certainly be making matters worse instead of better. I want to ponder the idea of human extinction as a result of climate change, and I'll start at a relatively basic fundamental point. There have been no humans on Earth at 3.3 or higher degrees above baseline in the past. Baseline meaning the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There was a, there was a time um, that the Earth warmed with humans on it to about 3.2 degrees above baseline but that change took place over many thousands of years. And there's some fairly quirky things about that event. We're headed for more than three and a half degrees centigrade above baseline in the very near future, in as little as 18 months. And almost certainly within the next decade or two. And so I'm suggesting that human extinction will result 
from absence of habitat. We need other organisms to sustain us. We're not so clever that we can assume that the food will keep showing up at the grocery store if there's no source of food beneath the grocery store. So we actually need a living planet to survive. We depend upon myriad other species, including bees, which are, as we know, particularly in North America, are completely collapsing. So without pollinators, without food, without the phytoplankton in the ocean, without land plants, we don't persist. Never mind the oxygen. That's a problem for much further down the road. The food is the thing. Even the slow rise of global average temperature that has been going on for a couple of hundred years exceeds the ability of organisms to adapt by 10,000 times. With the slow change we've experienced so far, plants and animals can't keep up. Now we can keep up because we're clever. Right? I think we should have been named Homo calidus, the clever ape, not Homo sapiens, the wise ape. Yeah. So we're clever, we can put on clothes, we can take off clothes, we can protect ourselves from the elements to an amazing extent. But if we lose the plants, that's no habitat for us. Now as individuals, you might argue that we could, and I actually heard this suggested by a climate scientist within the last couple of weeks, we can go live on nuclear submarines that are fully packed with food. <laughs> no, really, he said that on the air. <laughs> out loud, in his out loud voice. <laughs> but, but then when the, when the submarine comes up on land, the people there will almost certainly notice that there's essentially no plants that will feed the humans. So that sounds problematic to me. <laughs> Apparently I'm just a bummer when it comes to the whole thing. So. It's a paper by James Hansen and colleagues from a few years ago indicating the collapse of industrial civilization will cause the global average temperature to increase by 1.2 plus or minus 0.2 degrees within a matter of a few days. And sure enough, on September 14th, 2001, scientists had the idea, I wonder what if, what about, um, there's planes not flying in the United States anymore. I wonder if that has any impact on global average temperature. And it did, it actually had a, a, a very easily measured, significant impact on the global average temperature. Just because on, on September 11th, 2001, US planes stopped flying. We didn't turn off the coal-fired power plants. The sulfates were still going up in the air. So this paper by Hansen and colleagues indicates that because of the absence of dimming associated with particulates in the air that reflect sunlight coming in, that the global average temperature will rise in a short period of time after civilization collapses. So let's just assume, taking the worst case scenario for humans and the best case scenario for every other organism on the planet, essentially, that collapse of industrial civilization is complete within the next few months. So I'm not making a prediction here. I'm just using these, these data, these figures, to point out how quickly we could lose habitat for humans and how long it might be on the other end. So I'm trying to bracket the um, terms, the, 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 the timing, under which we might see loss of habitat for human animals on this planet. The paper by Hansen and colleagues was demonstrated to be way too conservative by two subsequent papers, so I think it's still conservative to stick with 1.4. The latest paper indicates that a reduction in atmospheric particulates as a result of industrial activity of only 35%, only 35% reduction could cause the temperature to rise by a full degree. So that's basically the collapse of China or Europe or American empire. Any one of those is approximately a third of the global average economic activity on the planet. So that's not much. So I think it's safe to conclude that 1.4 is locked in when civilization collapses. One of the other adverse consequences of that event, since it takes somewhere between a decade and six decades, to decommission a nuclear power plant is that we'll see the world's 442 nuclear power plants melt down catastrophically in a short period of time. Collapse of civilization means nobody gets paid anymore. It can result from any number of factors. Uh, disruption in the credit supply, 
which almost took down the whole game of cards in late 2008, according to Ben Bernanke, then chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. It could be a disruption of food being delivered. According to David Korowicz, writing for the Foster Group in June of 2012, a disruption in the supply chain of anything significant will terminate the world's industrial civilization within three weeks. And anything important means food, water, uh, shipping. Um, the bond markets could seize up and cause credit to be in limited supply and so on. So when that happens, if money's not worth anything anymore, if people can't get to their jobs for one reason or another, we have the kinds of fires in 1,200 spent fuel rod pools that this planet has never seen before spewing ionizing radiation over the entire globe. 442 nuclear power plants, nobody's working to decommission any of them. That's such a depressing thing that I'd like to talk, <laughs> and talk more about climate, which is much more fun. Natalia Shikova is a field researcher who has conducted research along with her partner Igor Samelotov in the Arctic, field research on methane released from the Arctic for about a decade now. And she concluded in November 2013 that a 50 gigaton burst of methane is highly possible at any time from the Arctic Ocean. And that would produce a global average temperature rise of about 1.3 degrees. I think that's a pretty conservative figure. It takes about a year for methane in the Arctic to be distributed throughout the globe. So this is not a, a, a methane burst that causes temperature to rise around the globe within a matter of days or weeks, unlike the, the global dimming. Okay, so this is something that will take about a year for the methane to be circulated completely around the globe. And that could happen uh, sort of hastened along by an ice-free Arctic. And it won't be long before we have an ice-free Arctic for the first time in human history. Humans have never been on this planet with an ice-free Arctic. And it looks like we're headed that way as early as this September. Here's the data from a, a few days ago, June 3rd. And it's the lowest, it, it, the ice cover is the lowest it's ever been on that date in history. In the period since 1979 that ice measurements have been taken in the Arctic. And so here's 2012 when we reached the lowest level ever. Notice that September, is the annual minimum for Arctic ice. So it could be, especially case in the long, if civilization collapses between now and then by the rapid increase in the warming. Or maybe it won't even take that. Maybe this alone will, will lead to an ice free Arctic as early as this year. The US Naval Academy conducted an analysis. The US Naval Postgraduate School conducted an analysis a few years ago and predicted a nice year Arctic next year. So in any event, I can't imagine it's going to be too long before there's going to be conditions that allow for even more rapid methane release than is already occurring from the Arctic Ocean. And that, that could well include this, this 50 gigaton burst that is highly possible at any time. Is that forcing the animals to go through the sun? Yeah, it's, it's having interesting impacts. Uh, the phytoplankton in, in the Arctic are actually blooming because it's so warm. Uh, the Arctic is warming much more rapidly than the global average. And so whereas there used to be a strong temperature gradient between the Arctic and the equator that would allow cold fronts to pass through very quickly. You know, when, when you and I were kids, you got a lot of stories that start like that. <laughs> When you and I were kids, the, the so-called Polar Express would, would take cold fronts across North America in three or four days. And now they're, they're locked in place for three or four months. Right? The polar vortex, the meander and gesture, and call it what you will. So it's having all kinds of impacts as a result of that, that reduced temperature gradient between the Arctic and the equator. Um, precipitation effects, all kinds of weird things are happening. So. If we add these things up, we're at 0.85 C above baseline, meaning the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, about 1750. We're at 0.85 degrees above baseline right now. We had 
from the collapse of industrial civilization and the warming associated with that at 1.3 associated with the 50 gigaton burst of methane that Talia Shikoku warns about. And then it looks like we're on track for a really significant El Nino event. The most recent event produced a 0.15 temperature increase, that's 97, 98. The ocean is a battery. It stores a lot of carbon dioxide and it stores a lot of heat. And during El Nino events, a bunch of that heat comes out. And it looks like this El Nino is on track to be as big or bigger than the one in 97, 98. So we could add another 1,500. So that takes us up to 3.7 C, potentially as early as September of this, sorry, not September of this year, September, October maybe for the Northern Hemisphere, but then a year later for that methane to fully circulate around the globe and reach everywhere on the planet so that we, we actually have a 3.7 degree global average. Remember, no humans at 3.3 or, or, or higher in the past. And again, our demise will not result from it being too warm for most of us or too cold for most of us, but rather will be from lack of food. The general scientific consensus until a few years ago was reflected in this paper by Oliver Tickell, the Guardian, from August 2008, headlined, on a planet 4C hotter, all we can prepare for is extinction. I'm not sure how to prepare for that, but whatever. And, and, he, and he discussed habitat storms so large they would level cities and, and the Dust Bowl coming again to the interior of large continents and having consequences for humans and other animals. What's, what strikes you here is the dead livestock, which, which should be and is more important, is the lack of vegetation. That's why the livestock died. So we're the livestock of the future when there's no plants to serve as the base of the food web. So it could be that 3.7 degrees won't drive us to extinction. We don't know. We haven't done this experiment yet. We're working on it. It must go faster. So it could be that 3.7 won't do the trick, that in fact 4 degrees is the point at which human extinction occurs. Or now that, it, now that four degrees is absolutely locked in, according to a number of sources, most recently Shell Oil Company, within the last couple of weeks, 4C is locked in in the near term, they say, and six over the longer term. So there's a huge number of organizations now that say 4C is not preventable. And so now, most climate scientists say 4C won't cause our extinction. <laughs> so it would have seven years ago, but now it won't, because we know more. <laughs> I don't know how we know that, because we haven't done the experiment. In any event, so it could be that 4 won't do the trick, that the shifting baseline has been shifted beyond the point at which humans are able to persist. I'm going to talk about one of many self-reinforcing feedback loops on the climate front, and that one is the first one that was reported in the refereed journal literature, that of uh, methane release from the Arctic Ocean. Methane is stored in a variety of ways in the relatively shallow continental shelves of the Arctic Ocean. And because it's relatively shallow, the, the, the methane that's there requires relatively little warming before it's released into the water column, as shown here, and then into the atmosphere. So for example, there are chemical cages called clathrates or hydrates which hold CH4 molecules within them. CH4 is methane, or we know it as natural gas. And when that chemical cage gets warm, warm enough, it breaks open and the methane is released. And that's what we're seeing here. And in much of the Arctic Ocean, the um, subsea permafrost left over from permafrost created and then covered by the water after the last glacial maximum. And um, the, the so-called clathrate gun, these chemical cages of methane, are, are laying there within a relatively shallow distance from the surface, at most a few hundred meters. So close enough that a little bit of warming has caused and will continue to cause methane to be released. 
at an exponential rate. As I indicated, this is the first one mentioned in the refereed journal literature as having begun, as being underway. Many of these self-reinforcing feedback loops have been known for a while, and they've always been a concern for the future. But this is the first one that people reported was actually triggered. I'll, talk, I'll, I'll mention a few others later. Um, in the paper in Global Policy in September 2012, written by Michael Jennings, he points out that methane from the Arctic Ocean, from the sea floor of the Arctic Ocean, is one of a suite of amplifying factors that appear to be irreversible. So it only took about three years for the scientific community to catch up with the fact that there's a bunch of these now and that they are irreversible. And when I say irreversible, I mean a temporal span is relevant to us. So tens of thousands of years. And, and I'll show a slide later indicating that they do in fact reverse at some point. Or at least they have in the past. According to NASA's car project in July of Two years ago, the methane plumes in the Arctic Ocean observed by satellites were up to 150 kilometers across. That is absolutely huge. Methane plumes, if, you, if, you, if you're in a sailing ship, in the middle of that, all you can see in every direction is a bubbling ocean. It, it looks like ginger ale or, or, or a boiling sea. So there's obviously a bunch of support from legitimate sources indicating that methane from the Arctic Ocean is being released rapidly. I suspect that's a primary contributor to atmospheric methane around the globe going exponential since about 2007. And there was the one reported in 2009 and I've been trying to keep track of these things, and it's nearly as I can tell we're up to 50 now, 50 that I know about. And others include things like a peat, peat in the world's boreal forests, and as it gets warmer and drier, that peat sublimates, turns from solid form to gaseous form almost immediately, and contributes more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, which makes it warmer and drier in the world's boreal forests, which causes the process to excel, accelerate even further. And there's other sources of methane, too. It's not just the Arctic Ocean. There's Russia. And you've probably read about those giant holes in the Yamal region of, Ru of Russia. Yamal literally translated means the end of the world. So there's massive holes out there that have methane levels more than 50,000 times the background level in these holes that have blown up. So there's permafrost that is melting very rapidly around the globe. There's methane being released from the Ring of Fire off the coast of New Zealand. So there are many factors. For example, storms are becoming more severe, and that causes vegetation to die. And therefore, the carbon is released from that vegetation even faster, which drives even bigger storms, and so on. So there's 50 of these. I'll give you a link later that you can point to and find out every detail. As a result of the one Arctic Ocean coming out of Ar Arctic Ocean releasing methane, as a result of that one self-reinforcing feedback with Paul Beckwith at the University of Ottawa, concluded in November of last year that a five to six degree increase within a decade or two has been triggered as a result of methane released from the Arctic Ocean. And he even pondered the idea of an 11 degree temperature rise as well. And He's been catching almost as much flack for that short video as I've been receiving for the last three years about speaking the unspeakable. Paul bases this prediction or forecast on, for example, a paper from the October 2013 issue of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences indicated five degree temperature rise 55 million years ago during a span of only 13 years. So, and you can see from the figure here that abrupt temperature rise is hardly uncommon in abrupt temperature decline. There's, there are relatively few stable states for the global average temperature of the planet, and the transitions from one to another occur quite suddenly. 
Consider, for example, the Great Dying 252 million years ago, right about here. And this took place, it's, it's not quite as abrupt as it seemed, this, this whole transition took place over about 20,000 years when it went from Ice Age to over 22C. But you see there are relatively few stable points. Here we are today, which has never been stable in planetary history. So you could argue that, that this, which is pretty close to where we're at, stable for a while, perhaps will stabilize here. That's the five or six degrees that Beckwith mentions, but there's not a lot of examples of that going on. And so it could be that we'll stabilize up here at the 11 degrees he mentions above baseline, or above where we're at now, roughly. So, we know there are these relatively rapid transitions and then there are points of stability. What we don't know is the negative feedbacks that cause us to go from, from the Jurassic style situation here and then experience a sudden decline. Well, that's probably a bad example, that was an asteroid. But we don't know what, what negative feedbacks are that drive these things. We know a lot about positive feedbacks, the so-called positive feedbacks, not necessarily positive for us, but the drive increases in temperature and accelerate, but we don't know why they did stop. What's so special about 22 degrees? Planetary average. We don't really know why temperature rise stops places like that. Now, 5C temperature rise doesn't sound like a big deal, right? We all experience more than that coming outside, inside today. You know, we do that every day, and it doesn't kill us. Again, it's about habitat. The, the Great Dying, as it's called, 252 million years ago, according to Michael Benton's 2003 model, was a 5C rise. Subsequent information indicates that the temperature rise was more like 8 degrees, or up to 8 degrees. But still, that took place over a span of 20,000 years. We're talking about 5 or 6, or maybe 11 degree temperature rise in the span of a decade or two. Organisms just can't keep up with the rate of change that's going on right now by a factor of 10,000. Imagine when the show really kicks in. Planetary science, planetary scientists assumed, as we all did for the entire history of planetary sciences, that Earth was right in the middle of the habitable zone for a sun like ours. And then a relatively recent paper indicates that, whoa, no, that's not quite right. Actually, Earth, which you see up there, at the inner edge of the green zone, is right at the inner edge of the habitable zone for a sun like ours. And in fact, we're, it seems far more likely with minor changes in atmospheric chemistry that we could go Venus than that we'll go Mars. Venus is the yellow plus sign inside of Earth there, closer to the sun. So it could be that with relatively minor changes in atmospheric chemistry, Earth will lose, will, will be driven out of the habitable zone. We'll lose habitat for humans. And the bad news is that there have not been minor changes in atmospheric chemistry of Earth. There have been major changes in atmospheric chemistry of Earth with an increase in carbon dioxide of more than 40% since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and an increase of methane since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution by about 250%. 250%. That's a big deal. So it could be that we're going to go Venus, as Sam Coran projects here. So here's the same slide I showed earlier with methane, atmospheric methane, and here's Sam Coran's um, temperature projection based on the methane release and indicating that the oceans will boil off by 28 or something like that. And I don't care how clever we are. We're not gonna live through that. I, I used this slide about a month ago in Europe and some guy in the front row was anxiously waiting after he showed the slide. He was just fidgeting something terrible and his hand shot up when I was done and he said, uh, I see you haven't been keeping up with the data. I'm like, I'm to keep up with the data again. <laughs> but I didn't say that. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He says, well, that figure you showed, this one right here, 
that looks fine through 2014, but then already, this is in March or April, he says we're into 2015 and, and the current readings aren't there, they're here. <gasps> And so the so the curve is way sharper than you're showing, and I just remember that just now, or I would have done the more recent curve here to show you. But we also don't have 2015 planetary average, which was shown here, right? That was just for the first three months, I think, of the year. So it could be that the curve is steeper than this. Maybe not. I like Farley Moa's line, although we wasn't talking about climate change, obviously, but uh, we're under some gross misconception that we're a good species going somewhere important and at the last minute we'll correct our errors and God will smile on us. It's delusion. <laughs> Not only is it delusion, but the last minute was a long time ago. We're, we're Thelma and Louise over the cliff, right? It's, we're, we're the roadrunner that goes out and, and we haven't looked down yet. But our fate is sealed. That it's, it's game over. It's delusion. The, it, it appears that even if we persist another couple thousand years, if we have Homo sapiens for another couple thousand years, we're still only going to be here one seventh as long as the typical mammal species on this planet. So I think it, it, it looks something like this for the history of humans. But you know, you don't mess with somebody else's cartoonist misogyny. You just keep the history of man up there. So it makes me twitch, but whatever. So, so here's humans, and we show up, and we look around, and we go, "What the hell's happening?" Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> you know, the, the universe is 3.8 billion years old. Right? This universe, this one universe that we know something about. Yeah. I'm sorry, 13.8 billion years. Thank you. <laughs> and so, so if, if my arm span represents 13.8 billion years, the 200,000 year run of our species is the last few cells at the end of... Oh, we're done. <laughs> at the end of my middle finger. We're, you know, we're a speck on a speck on a speck, and we think it's all about us. Look, the universe was made for us. Yeah, well, we didn't show up for the first 13.8 billion years, but I suppose you could say it's all about us. We're just late to the party. <laughs> but, unless you think I'm the only crazy person on the planet, there are others who think we're headed for human extinction in the near term. Not all of these as a result of climate change. Um, Fenner and Neil Dawes, the first and fifth names on the list here, are both biologists who correctly recognize that it's about habitat. And they say industrial civilization generally is destroying habitat. Climate change is one, one representation of that, but certainly not the only one. And so they conclude near-term human extinction is a result of habitat change. And those, all these people are smarter than me. People like Noam Chomsky, and who you probably know about, and Paul Ehrlich, the conservation biologist, and I'm looking for a name, and the, the, the things are too big. Uh, Chris Hedges recently concluded the same. I see that his name didn't make the list for some reason. Um, one of the more recent names on the list is somebody who has far more influence in the United States than any scientist. Speaking of scientists, notice Louise Leakey, the anthropologist, and her father, Richard Leakey, are on the list as well. Aaron Sorkin is a writer for television. So he's actually influential in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and he concluded near term human extinction in this episode he wrote for the newsroom. A little, I'm just going to show a little four minute clip from a show called The Newsroom and let you soak it in for a minute. So there won't be any hard questions. I'm just going to ask you to spend a report, which I need an expert witness. And Sounds good. In 10. Stand by camera one. The question remains, how will we respond? And joining us now in the studio is Richard Westbrook, Deputy Assistant Administrator of the EPA. Welcome. Thank you. Mr. Westbrook, you've spent most of your professional career as a climate scientist in the public sector. Yes, 10 years as a supervisor and management analyst in the Office of Environmental Information. 
before that, I was a program specialist in the EPA's resource management division. And you have a PhD in climate science from Stanford. Yes, and another in chemistry with a master's in biology. Okay. Tell us about the findings in the report that was just released. The latest measurements taken at Mauna Loa in Hawaii indicate a CO2 level of 400 parts per million. Just so we know what we're talking about, if you were a doctor and we were the patient, what's your problem? A thousand years? Two thousand years? A person has already been born who will die due to catastrophic failure of the planet. What did he just say? Okay, can you uh, expand on that? Sure. Um, the last time there was this much CO2 in the air, the oceans were 80 feet higher than they are now. Two things you should know. Half the world's population lives within 120 miles of the ocean. And the other? Humans can't breathe underwater. You're saying the situation's dying. Not exactly. Um, your house is burning to the ground. The situation's done. Your house has already burned to the ground. The situation's over. So what can we do to reverse this? There's a lot we can do. But from 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, Can you make an analogy that might help us understand? Sure. Um, it's as if you're sitting in your car, uh, in your garage, with the engine running, the door closed, and you slipped into unconsciousness. That's it. What if someone comes and opens the door? You want to be dead. What if the person got there in time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now what's the CO2 equivalent of the getting there in time? Shutting off the car 20 years ago. You sound like you're saying it's hopeless. Yeah. Is that the uh, administration's position? There isn't a position on this anymore than there's a position on the temperature at which we call it. The administration, let me try to, your administration. And don't forget I mean the administration. Solar, clean coal, nuclear power, raising fuel economy standards, and building a more efficient electrical grid. Yes. And? That would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> the report says we can release 565 more gigatons of CO2 without the effects being cool. It says we can only release 565. So what if we only release 564? Well then we would have a reasonable shot at some form of dystopian post-apocalyptic life. But the carbon dioxide and oil that we've already released is 2,795 gigatons. So. What would all this look like? Well, mass migrations, food and water shortages, spread of deadly disease, endless wildfires, way too many to keep under control, storms that have the power to level cities, blacken out the sky, and create permanent darkness. Are you going to get in trouble for saying this publicly? Who cares? Just one more time. Well, that's the thing, Will. Americans are optimistic by nature. And if we face this problem head on, if we listen to our best scientists and act decisively and passionately, I still don't see any way we can survive. OK. Richard, <laughs> of the EPA. Thank you for joining us. I didn't even get a credit. <laughs> I should point out a few things. He mentions the 80 foot or 23 meter sea level rise that's locked in as a result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've known that since COP15 in 2005. That's based on actual data from the past, not based on models. We also know that the temperature rise associated with current levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we've locked in six degrees. He failed to mention that part. Everything he mentions as likely to, he also only takes into account carbon dioxide with respect to temperature rise and sea level rise. No consideration of methane or the other few greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In addition, everything he points out is going to occur in the future is already underway. Mass migrations, when I spoke in Europe, all the talk was about people immigrating from Northern Africa. When I was in New Zealand, six or eight months ago, all the talk was about opening the borders for the first time ever 
to climate refugees. We're coming in waves. It used to cost $2 million American to get into, to, into New Zealand, or one of a handful of very rare skills. Now, the entry fee is that you live on one of the small South Island states, in one of those states, where the habitat is being destroyed by climate change. Come on in. Mass migrations are already underway. Food and water shortages are already underway. Storms that have the power to level cities and create permanent darkness. I'm sure you, you remember Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines. All of these events are already underway. They're happening now. They're not something that's going to happen. Well, they are something that's going to happen in the future. Fires too big to control, all the way from Siberia to British Columbia. And the fire season is just getting started. Snowpack in California, first time ever, ever in history of measurements, the snowpack is at 0% in May, before the summer begins. All of this is currently underway. It's not a problem for the grandchildren. I heard my whole life that environmental issues were a problem for the grandchildren since I was a wee, wee grandchild. <laughs> and now I'm not such a wee grandchild anymore. I'm old enough to have grandchildren of my own. But we haven't done anything. We've just kept claiming that it's a problem for the grandchildren. It's not a problem, it's a predicament. And it's not for the grandchildren. It's for 20 years ago, or maybe 10. So the question arises, what the, I mean, now what? <laughs> and, and, and Richard Feynman wrote the report um, of the Challenger disaster and pointed out in that report that reality must take precedence over public relations, including what corporations tell us, including what the corporate governments tell us. For nature cannot be fooled. So I think it's important to recognize reality for what it is instead of giving false hope. I would argue that all hope is false hope. That it, you know, if, if a medical doctor knows that there's a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to die in six weeks, and the medical doctor does not tell you that, we have a word for that. It's malpractice. We know that 4C temperature rise is locked in in the near term. We know that 6 degrees is locked in in the not too distant term, based only upon carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We know that methane is, has gone exponential in the atmosphere. We know how powerful methane is as a greenhouse gas. We know all these things, but you can't get a self-respecting employed climate scientist to say anything about it. Michael Mann, one of the two famous, most famous climate scientists in the world, was asked by a friend and colleague of mine what he thought about near-term human extinction as a result of climate change. And Michael Mann responded on Facebook. So right there in the most public of spheres, Michael Mann responds, I can't go there, Kevin. What does that mean? Why did he say that? I can't go there, Kevin. Why did he say that? What's that? What's he afraid of? Um, he's afraid of being disparaged by society. He's afraid of losing his status as a well-paid, privileged white man in a well-paid, privileged white man's world. He's afraid of attracting the attention of the government, the second and, and second most dire Chinese curse after we live in interesting times. And one ahead of, you find what you're looking for. I think he's afraid of a lot of things. He's, he's only 46 years old. He can't imagine a future that, that isn't uh, tied up in patriarchy. That doesn't have the, the white, mostly white people in the global north who make quite a bit of money able to run the show, whatever that means. Nature cannot be fooled. I don't know why he's afraid to give an opinion on a matter for which he's one of the premier voices in the world. When he was interviewed by Tom Hartman on RT, oh, about six months ago, I guess, at this point, he was asked by Hartman, what can we do? And Michael Mann, one of the two most famous climate scientists in the world, up there with James Hansen, said, well, first of all, we have to keep burning coal. 
<laughs> what did he say? <laughs> Michael Mann says we have to keep burning the dirtiest of the dirty fossil fuels. We have to keep burning coal because if we don't, those sulfates are going to fall out of the atmosphere. They fall out all the time. Anyway, if we stop putting them up there, we lose global dimming. And then we experience catastrophic temperature rise, probably enough to cause our extinction in the near term. We have to keep burning coal because it's all about us. 13.8 billion years of the universe, we showed up the day before yesterday. We think it's all about us. <laughs> When you're a patriarch in a patriarchal world, you can't even imagine that it could be any different or that it might not be about you. I think that's a big part of it. We have to keep burning coal. Maybe it's not about us. Maybe it was never about us. Maybe we're one of millions and millions of species to occupy the planet and we're going to go extinct just like all the rest of them. Of course we are. Maybe we're, we're one among 7.3 billion people on the planet and we're going to die. Of course we are. But you knew that when you were 11. So what's important to him is more important than the, the future of the species. I have really good news. I like to finish like a Hollywood movie. Because otherwise people think I was depressing. <laughs> what? See, people laugh when I'm not telling jokes. And they don't laugh when I don't <laughs> We know a lot about DNA at this point, enough to know how incredibly rare we are, enough to know that, that this DNA coming to collect, uh, in, into form, in physical form, for you to be here, the odds against that happening are greater than the odds of you buying one lottery ticket every week and winning for the rest of your life. And yet, here you are, against those incredibly long odds we get to be here. We get to live. So, we get to die. Death is the end, right? But without death, we don't have life. So we get to be here. The good news is we get to die. And what that means is we get to live. We, we who appear here in physical form, we, the privileged, the lucky ones, we get to. It's not a have to thing. It's not like going to your shitty job where you wake up in the morning and you just slap around and like, Jesus, I have to live again today. <laughs> oh, I didn't have to live today. And then you go to work and you come back and you're still alive and it's just horrible. It's not that. We get to live. We are privileged to be here. We get to live. This is incredible. This is essentially impossible for this to have happened. And yet, here we are. As evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins says, in the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I that are privileged to be here, privileged with eyes to see where we are and brains to wonder why. And not only that, we're here at the most incredible, amazing, astonishing time in all of history. Not just because it's the end. Everybody else left the movie halfway through and we get to see the whole thing. Not just because of that, but because we get to know we get to know everything. You can take a digital device that fits in the palm of your hand that has more computing power than a supercomputer that would fill this room three times 40 years ago. You get to take this device out with you almost anywhere on the planet and ask, ask the question, what are the odds of me being here? And you'll find out that they're astronomical. And then you get to, and, and so you have enormous privilege already. And then you ask, how, how important am I? And you find out that you're a speck on a speck on a speck. You're just a worthless piece of skin that the universe sloughed off <laughs> in an uncaring, amoral way. Other than that, Mrs. Kennedy, how was your day? So we have, we're, we're here at the most incredible time in human history. We get to know that we're really nothing at all as far as the universe is concerned. And also we're amazing and incredible that and, and with, we get to be here with the technology to know how incredible, how astonishing that is. It's this, this two sides of the, of the sword, right? The double-edged sword. We're worthless pieces of speck from the, uh, from the universe's perspective. We're, we're, the, we're the last little bit of skin that's sloughed off in an uncaring universe. And yet, here we are. We get to know that, we get to know both of those things. Sir? 
The universe doesn't make judgments like that. No, I know. That's what I said. The universe is amoral. Yeah, but it doesn't make judgments. It doesn't care. We're worthless friends. Oh, right. Okay. So it might be a stretch to say that the universe thinks that we're worthless. The universe doesn't well, think. In fact, we are little pieces of the universe. Sure. And you know, I, I'm reminded of the clip by George Carlin. <laughs> Almost all the time. George Carlin says, the universe needed us to make plastic. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we have plastic covering the whole globe, the universe is done with us. Rug us off like a bad case of fleas. <laughs> Whatever. And by the way, I'm willing to bet that, that in light of this really good news, that we get to be here against cosmological odds, I'm willing to bet that when we get to the end of our lives, almost none of us, and certainly nobody in this room, responds with, on their deathbed, I should have bought them. <laughs> I just don't see that happening. I see, instead, people at the end of their days pondering how they could have brought more joy to the lives of others, how they could have brought more love to the planet, how they could have lived, how they could have lived instead of dying slowly. What could they have done? I don't get this question a lot. Instead, I get the statement. That one, he's wrong. With an exclamation mark at the end, not a question mark. Even if all the models are right, and basically I haven't said anything today, I've just presented the data given by others. Right? The paper by Hanson, the subsequent papers, the methane released from the Arctic Ocean, all backed with projection about how long that gives us on the planet, the proceedings National Academy of Sciences, this show the other people's data. I haven't collected raw data for more than six years since I've left active service at the university. And I, even if I'm wrong about all this, I still have really good news. We still get to die. And that means we get to live against cosmological odds. A case in point, the world's oldest person turned 117 years in early March of this year. And when asked to ponder what the first 117 years were like, she said, it seemed rather short. <laughs> I used to say, even if you live to be 100, it's going to seem rather short. Apparently, even if you live to be 117, it seems rather short. I thought this was awesome when this, newspaper, when this news story first came out because it really hammered home one of the points I've been trying to make. And then she died three weeks later to illustrate the further point that I've been trying to make, <laughs> that birth is lethal. <laughs> that even if you live to be 117, it seems rather short, and you die anyway. If you want to know more, and my goodness, how could you not? <laughs> Extension Dialogues is my latest book. And, and the whole story of the book really is the subtitle, How to Live with Death in Mind. Contrary to what you read on the internet, I'm pro not promoting a, a suicide death culture. <laughs> I, I'm not teaching people to go around and be miserable for the rest of your short life. None of that. Uh, all the scientific information is presented at this one essay at Nature Bats Labs. So if you're just interested in those, in those 49 other irreversible self-reinforcing feedback loops, you can find out about those here in this relatively long and often updated essay. I want to finish with, with just a short comment um, about, about the odds against us being here and this, the significance from the perspective of a cosmological time scale. By pointing out that, that the one, on the one hand, we don't have a lot of power. You know, you and I are not going to stop the train from smashing into the cliff. You and I are not going to recycle our way out of this. But we do have enormous power at the level we live our lives. We spend time with relatively few people most of the time. And we're probably even pretty close to those people, to our family and our loved ones, to the people we consider in our circle of friends. And we have enormous power over those relationships. 
And I think that's where we should focus. In, in the spirit of living in the now and living with the ones we're with and even loving those ones we're with, that we're with, perhaps we should live here now. Perhaps we should take that power that we have to influence the lives of those around us and create joy in those lives for others and for ourselves. And I think that's not only a power, it's a responsibility. I think it's not only a responsibility, it's a joy and a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much.